that the church had this challenging situation. Are they going to do everything they can to make things right? That's what we're going to find out today in Acts 6. We start out Acts 6, where it's talking about how the disciples were increasing. And so when we're talking about disciples, I think the original idea of disciples were people who were absolutely following Jesus and listening to the words he said. We'll hear many times in the Gospels where it says he was talking to the apostles and the disciples were there too, the people who were listening to Jesus. In this case, now, this is a brand new church and it's increasing. It says that a complaint um, by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution, helping the widows, you know, making sure they had what they needed, had the food that they needed. And so in some sense, they were being discriminated against. Now, the Hebrews would be the people who were the Jews who lived in this area. Maybe some of them came all the way back from the time that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, their families had lived there forever, possessed land in the area. These were people who probably came back from the exiles of the Assyrians and the Babylonian captivity. So they were people who were part of like kind of the core. The Greek Jews lived throughout the Roman Empire now. So remember, the Roman Empire swallowed Greece and took on a lot of the characteristics of the Greeks. But these would be Jews that were living there. I wonder, too, if it's necessarily Jews, but it would be Greek style people. Remember, Alexander wiped through this area in around 300 AD, and they were there until they were kicked out and the Maccabees retook the temple and retook the area. Still Greeks living there. And some people indicated that the Greek Jews spoke Greek. They read the Old Testament in Greek. There was a fantastic translation that was made of the Bible, the Old Testament, into Greek. And so they probably spoke Greek. Almost everyone spoke Greek because that was kind of a going language, but they were more Greek. And in fact, a lot of people felt Paul was a Hellenist, possibly. We don't know that for sure. Another question to ask at the end of times. So Hebrew-speaking Jews versus Greek-speaking Jews. And so probably the Hebrew-speaking Jews could speak both Hebrew and Greek, while it's unsure how much the Greek Jews spoke any Hebrew at all. They were most likely throughout the Roman Empire. And they're saying, look, you know, you're taking care of the widows, but you're kind of neglecting ours. Nobody knows if this was an intentional thing, but most people feel that it was probably something cultural. I remember once I was eating someplace, forgot where it was, and it was kind of a ranch-like situation. And all of a sudden there was a tone. And I didn't know what the tone was. And so I didn't come inside. And then the tone struck again. And I came in to realize, oh, I missed dinner. And they said, well, the tone is announcing that dinner is being served. And I'm like, oh, okay, I got you now. Was the church intentionally not feeding widows? That sounds kind of weird. So it was probably something cultural. It was probably something that they didn't understand. And so they said, okay, okay. So the 12 summoned the whole number of the disciples and say, hey, you know, this isn't right. But we need to feed these widows, right? Something has to happen. And it's saying, too, we're doing the preaching and giving people the word of God. So we shouldn't be doing this, quote, to serve tables. A lot of people run with this and say, oh, well, serving tables is below you. It's not what they're saying at all. In fact, they're making this such an important part of it. They ask that seven men of good repute are going to be picked, make sure they're full of spirit and wisdom, and we're going to point them to this duty. We'll devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word, and you do this. So it's not like they were neglecting it. They were looking down upon it, anything like that. They were just saying, we have this one set of skills. We were with Jesus. We're preaching. We're healing. We're sending out the word. We're going to stick to that. But we also want to put good people in place to take care of this problem. So it's not dismissive at all. Uh, You know, it's kind of interesting. I I kind of felt a little bit during this passage. Unfortunately, in most times in churches, what you're asked to do may not be matched to the thing you're good at. Now, 
as you can see, I'm a talk. I love talking. I love training. I am a trainer from corporate software company. I love doing this kind of work where I'm building curriculums. I'm teaching people. I'm talking to people. And every time, unfortunately, my church asks to do anything, it ends up being cooking. And I am not much of a cook. That is not my skill. Primarily what I eat is very simple foods because I don't cook. And I don't cook for myself. I don't eat for other people. And I don't like to cook baked goods because I'm trying to lose weight. And so if I have baked goods, then I'm going to start eating baked goods. Again, I'm not trying to look down on that. I think it's amazing the amount of feeding my church does, but that's not my thing. It's not really the thing I'm good at. And what we find out in Second Corinthians is that everyone has talents and gifts at Telios, and we should be using those. And sometimes there are elbows in the church community and eyeballs in the church community and ears in the church community, and we should be geared towards what we're good at. And I think that's what they're saying here. We have very specific skills and we should be doing those things because they go on. And like I said, they get very good people. Stephen, a man of faith and the Holy Spirit. And then they give the whole names of everyone who does this. This isn't the end all be all. And this is not the thing they're going to do forever because we're going to find out Stephen really takes off from this assignment. They even have the, the apostles pray and lay hands upon them. So this is a commission. It might not be a verbal ministry like a pastor, but this is a commission to do a task and do it right. So they honored the problem. The word of God continued to increase. The number of disciples multiplied. And many people in Jerusalem, even some priests, became obedient to the faith. So this was a good decision. So I think that it's important for us to realize that just because we're not good at a thing, you know, we, we can't serve God or we shouldn't serve God. I g give this example when I do the presentation at the college that it's unfortunate that many churches will do, you know, usually like a pamphlet handing out type. Now go to every house in our neighborhood and hand out these pamphlets and go door to door. My best friend is a fantastic writer, but she is not the person who's going to go door to door. So now, because she's not going to do that, she's kind of cut out of witnessing to people. She could, with her writing, do some amazing things. So I think it is important as we're looking at our fellow congregants to realize some people have some skills and other people have other skills. And how can we best match up skills with people? And I want to say for the record, I get it. Sometimes churches, organizations have to do something. Like we needed to find someone now to help those widows. Or sometimes we need someone now to set up chairs, to bake goods. I get it. At times we have to buckle down and do something. And every time it's not going to happen. And for me, it really hasn't happened, which is why I started doing these podcasts. I'm a talker. This is where my skill set is. And so I hope it is. And this is what I want to do, and this is what I hope I can do more of. But sometimes our church does have needs, like in this case, where we have to make sure the widows are being served. People are going to get called up. But Stephen was doing great signs and wonders among the people. So he was joined into this committee. He wasn't one of the apostles. And I think he wasn't even considered to be someone who saw Jesus and his ministry. He is someone that came up later. And some of those, it says, belong to a synagogue of the freedmen. We don't know much about that. He had Simon of Cyrene, I think was in Africa, and Alexandrians, those are the Greeks, Sicilians, Asians, and rose up and disputed with Stephen. So Stephen's out there doing signs and wonders, amazing things, and they could not withstand the wisdom he was saying. So they, and this is going to be People who are not followers of Jesus basically started generating arguments. Some people suspect that one of these freemen, possibly Paul. So it said it stirred up people and the elders and the scribes have to get involved now. And so they came with him and seized him, brought him before the council, and, and they set up false witnesses. People who would lie about what Stephen was doing. This man won't shut up and speaking words against this holy place. For we heard him say that Jesus will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. 
And it says that when they looked at him, he had the face of an angel. And I don't think it means he had a baby angel face or the thing that Ezekiel saw. I think it means just that he was at peace and calm, more like the angels we saw at the tomb of Jesus, really, you know, at peace with everything. Now, let's take a look at their accusations because it said that they had set up false witnesses. Jesus didn't say he's going to destroy this place. He's saying this place is going to be destroyed. So there's an out of truth in this, but that is not what Jesus said. And it says, we'll change the customs that Moses delivered to us. We talked about the new wine and the old wineskin. Some of those customs, it's true. We're going to go away. We are not called to do the things that many of the people at that time did in what they thought was honoring God. We don't go to the temple because God is with us. We don't have to go and do these animal sacrifices, these pilgrimage, these bringing money to the temple in Jerusalem because we have God and earth everywhere right now. And animal sacrifices are gone. So is it partially true that he's going to change the customs Moses delivered to us? Yeah, absolutely. But because those customs were there to bind people together, we're going to get into this when we get into the Old Testament. Sacrifice an animal was about taking something that was precious to you that you could really need. Like, I would really love to have this calf, but I'm going to sacrifice it to God because it is so vital to me. So when we sacrifice, right, we're going to give up something very important to ourselves to say, I trust God. And so the point of animal sacrifice was not the animal. The, the, uh, the point of some of these cultural things that Moses told them to do were about remembrance were about treating each other well, the laws that Moses gave, but it wasn't an end unto itself. So anyway, we're, that's a big other conversation. So that ends Acts 6. What I'm going to meditate on is how this man who was given this duty and trusted to do this duty to fix this situation about the widows who were being neglected. We never heard of this happening again or people complaining again so I believe that this solved the problem. Whatever they did, it solved the problem. The church continued to grow. People continued to come from all over the place, not just Hebrew, Jews, but Gentiles, Sumerians, everyone. So people must have fixed this situation. And they took the situation seriously. And so I'm going to think about how a church really sticks together like this, how a church should stick together. Look at the things that they're doing. And when something's not going right, put people of high value in those positions who can fix this situation. And what I'm going to pray about is the fact that I find something, even with my, within my own church, of using my talents and skills to help the church, whether it's the church with the little C or the big C. But one way or the other, I'm hoping to use my talents and skills in order to help the church. And what I'm going to tell others is the fact that Stephen did amazing things, took this first challenge and did great. He grew to the point where now he was able to stand against the consul, just like Peter and the apostles were doing, and say, this is the truth I'm speaking. This is exactly what I'm saying. And I'm going to stand here and obey Jesus Christ and not fall to the opinions of men. And I'm going to do so in such a way that I have the peace that an angel has. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe. Tell a friend. You can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear from you and how everything's going. Are you reading along? Are you getting a lot out of it? Are you learning some things? I'd love to hear about it. Have a great day. 